hear me? Uh, thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, and thank you for having me. This is a wicked way to start a day with 250 women who are risk seeking. I feel at home. Um, and I'm here for the obvious reason that I was an extreme athlete and I raced 140 kilometers an hour down icy mountains and feared for my life on a weekly basis. Um, <laughs> But looking objectively back at my career, I've been retired for about a year now, and I think that's not necessarily the juiciest part of my journey. Um, I had a textbook upbringing with athletics. I was, you know, racing locally and then provincially, and I made the national team right out of high school with what I call, I guess, staple skills, you know, time management, grit, a little bit of focus and discipline, some sacrifice. And I made the national team at a really epic time. We had just won the bid for the Vancouver Olympics, and there was momentum and excitement and lots of focus on sport and what it's worth. And I made the team with this powerhouse group of women. They were extremely great role models, professional. They knew what their goals were and what they were willing to do to achieve them. And everything was on the up and up. I mean, I thought maybe falling once in a while was a struggle, but um, everything was climbing the ladder as it should. And one month before the opening ceremonies, I crashed in France, I had dislocated my knee, tore everything you can tear, and it was immediately a change in trajectory. I flew home from, from France, and I remember reading in the Toronto Star, your cue sustains a career-ending injury. Mm -hmm. And I, it's a unique thing, you know, to read your fate like that, black and white in the newspaper, and I thought, that's... Uh, it's too early to swear. That sucks, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to do, <laughs> to do with that. And I was, a, I'm extremely stubborn, not a little, I'm very stubborn. And I just thought, you know, health is too sensitive to just leave this up to the newspaper. So I did all the unconventional things. I did a hell of a lot of trial and error, a thousand, thousands of hours of rehab. And I, after two and a half years, returned to this crazy sport. And I made it back on the national team. And the wonderful thing about amateur sport is these four-year cycles for Olympics. And we had Sochi on our horizon now, 2014. And I was going to lead the team. I mean, it was not a role I was ready for. But my teammates at that point were either mums or injured or um, retired at that point. So it was my job. And innately, I'm a bit of an introvert. We were just talking about that. And, uh, you know, back of the classroom kind of observant type, but this was my time to, well, time. I didn't have a choice. I wanted to go to Sochi and I was going to lead the team. In the lead up to the games, it was about eight months out and I thought, you know, not one to pat myself on the back, but it's probably time to reset, just go on a little holiday and applaud the comeback. It was successful and now reset and give myself this new jazz for going to Sochi. I went to Mexico with a friend and I'm sipping, sipping mojitos. <laughs> and I got this email from a staff member at the Canadian ski team and it said, um, hi Larissa, we no longer have an Olympic spot for you, but we wish you all the best. <laughs> <laughs> and I cried like someone had died. I mean, I, it was the most, another big change in trajectory, but the most heartbreaking thing I could have handled. I mean, my first thought was I have n not enough mojitos in front of me to handle this. <laughs> but I was still there for like three more days, so it's fine. But I, I was devastated. I mean, part of the old me did die with that news. I had never been thrown for such a loop and taken, I mean, I had slaved for this. I had, I had, I had given my life over for nine years at that point to this sport and the idea that I could represent my country for sport and I didn't have any missed calls and I thought how can an email be enough you know so after the the crying and the heartbreak and you know trying to explain to the people in my close circle what had happened looking back it was a fork in the road but in, in the moment I, I didn't feel that I had a choice I knew myself I'm extremely stubborn and when I think about a, a, a side story, I looked up risk when I was asked to come here, uh, the definition, just to be sure, and, um, and it said something to the effect of, uh, of the level of exposure to danger. And when I thought about this fork in the road, you know, do I, do I wash my hands of the sport because I was told to, or do I try? And whatever try looks like, no guarantees, no results, for sure, 
but I knew what try would look like. And I thought, it's more dangerous for me in this moment to close up shop and try to live with myself, wake up every day with myself, go to bed every night with myself and think, no, 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 you did everything you could have. I didn't buy it. I didn't even buy my own story. So very, it, was, it was maybe a week, and I realized that I don't have a choice in this. I have to try and separate myself for sure from what, I would, what would probably be an inevitable fail. The obstacles were plenty. They're almost insurmountable. I had about four months to do this and call myself something and raise the money and get a team together, but I thought I, this is my only way of going brilliantly on with my next chapter. So I gave myself a year to give it a, give it a shot, and over the next four months, I raised 150 grand here in Toronto, and I felt bad for myself almost every day. Mm-hmm. I pitied my situation. I would train at York University. I'd sweat like hell, and then I'd shower and get in the car, and I was still sweating on my way to these pitch meetings trying to tell my story about passion and ask for money and blow dry my hair out the window. Like, the 401 was a great <laughs> time to do that. And, rip into these waiting rooms and and I'd be still sweating down the backs of my knees and I'm thinking, why me? Like, why do I have to do this? It's enough to be an athlete. You know, everyone else is just training and I'm running around the city trying to raise this money. But in each of those moments that I pitied myself, I thought, what choice do you have? So so what, you wanna wanna go home and crawl in your mom's lap? You're late 20s, that's weird, first of all. (laughs) But second of all, like, I didn't, I really didn't have a choice. I thought, you've already weighed this. You've already weighed all your options, and you already decided to go down this road. It may not work, but this is for your sanity, Larissa. <laughs> so I just kept going, and, and I'll kind of come back to where asking questions after this, but um, the perfect perk in all of this was I didn't have anybody to pave the way for me. So I didn't wait for a normal. I didn't wait for someone to say, no, no, this is supposed to happen, or um, this does hurt that bad. I just kept putting one step in front of the other and kept my goals forefront. And eventually I went to the Olympics and I qualified, I was more qualified than any other skier, even on this soft cushion of the Canadian ski team at that point. And I raced to 20th, it was nothing I dreamed of, but it was my most proud moment. And then I went on with Team Larissa for three more years and I finished my career last year, ranked third in the world. It was a place, um, I won't talk too much about regret because I'm trying to stay in my 10 minutes, but um, my biggest regret is that I didn't believe for so many years that I could too also be um, world class. And I, introverted is one thing, but to not believe that you're worthy of that kind of success is a waste of time. And I learned that the hard way, the really long way and multiple knee surgeries and all that way. Um, but I'm so grateful at this point that I got forced and I got uh, really desperate because I think those, those skills and those tools in our toolboxes, we don't use them unless we really have to, and then you learn what you're capable of. But if I can, I guess, leave you with some probing things, um, one would be to understand uh, what, you, what, could, what would you do if you couldn't fail? Because in that situation, in that fork in the road, I realized, okay, success is easy to define. I'm sure everyone in this room is goal set and they have a clear idea of what they would consider to be successful. But do you understand then what would be failure? What would be, what, where's your window of opportunity? Because it's, for me, it was actually way bigger than I thought. I had a small window of opportunity in the sense that I raced for two minutes and I had four months to raise you know, six figures, but I actually had so much room to move. And when failing was only just not trying, I could do anything I wanted. And I think understanding that spectrum for yourself and and thinking of answering that question like on a piece of paper, what would you do if you couldn't fail is, can be interesting. The other thing, and you touched on it as well, like defining for yourself the difference between a risk and actual exposure to danger and then vulnerable moments, you know, do you fear for your ego in that situation? I mean, for me, my, my, my uh, display of belief in myself was public. So if I was wrong, I had to answer to the media about that. And I had to come up with ways to save face. But 
it was still not as big a risk as not trying. So defining for myself what was vulnerable and then what was a true risk and a detriment, detriment to my future was really powerful. And the third thing, now my email from this guy was dramatic and pivotal. It's not always so um, life-changing in that sense. What I'm realizing now, having retired, is that it's usually sh shying away from small things day to day. It's, it's, okay, so I put my running shoes on and a sports bra in the morning instead of a real bra and boots <laughs> because I'm one step closer to actually going out for a run or a walk or going to the gym. I can do that because I study at home and I'm basically alone all day. But it's me being lazy about the commitment it takes to do an exercise. Um, usually, my point is that if you can change your own culture for how you feel about taking risks and stretching yourself and challenging yourself, then that one comes along that's super dramatic. It just feels a lot closer because you're very um, habitual at that point with how you take on those things that are a little bit itchy or uncomfortable. You, you actually get to a place where you're comfortable with being uncomfortable and it's not that crazy anymore. I mean, I raced 140 kilometers an hour. That's a, an insane, but I got insane slowly over time. <laughs> um, you, you know, you itch away at, you, you um, pick away at those moments that make you feel uneasy and you can't control, but eventually it becomes the new you and the language you speak and the, and the behavior that you go about your day with. And whether people are following you or not, it's extremely empowering and it doesn't have to happen overnight. It, it, it's something that you acquire. And for me, I'm forever grateful that I was so forced down a tough path, challenged initially physically, then politically, financially, emotionally, socially. And each of those taught me that I, I have everything within me that I need to be world class. And, and it was successful. So. Um, is my time up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll talk soon.